Thank you for joining this uh, ECA webinar on the OECD QSAR toolbox applications for rich and beyond. My name is Andrea Gissi. I am a scientific officer working in the Computational Assessment Unit of the European Chemicals Agency. I am the QSAR Toolbox Project Manager and I am the organizer of this webinar. What you can expect from today? You will understand how ECA assesses QSAR Toolbox results in rich dossier evaluation. And we will have practical examples on how authorities and institutions across the world use the QSAR Toolbox. So, as the title of the webinar suggests, we will not talk only about REACH, but also about uh, uh, different regulations in the world. We will also see the project status and what we plan to do for the future of the QSAR Toolbox. If you have any questions, you can submit them on the website slido.com using the event code QSAR Tool. You can send questions from 11 to 1 p.m. Helsinki time only questions within the scope of this webinar. And if there are questions not answered, or if you are watching a record uh, of this webinar, please contact us at eka.europa.eu slash contact. The material of this webinar will be available at the link that you can see on the slide. After my introduction, we will have a presentation on QSAR toolbox, current status and future developments by Patience Brown from the OECD. Then I will give a presentation on QSAR Toolbox in rich registration. After me, my colleague Doris Hirman will talk about QSAR Toolbox supporting PBT identification under rich. After that, Denmark will present their experience on, on screening substances using the QSAR Toolbox. Then we will have Cecilia Bossa from Italy, showing how QSAR toolbox can be used to support genotoxicity assessment of chemicals. Then we will have Mark Bonnell from Canada, showing the application of the QSAR toolbox for ecological priority setting and risk assessment of organic chemicals. Then we will have Yuki Sakuratani from the National Institute of Technology and Evaluation in Japan, talking about QSAR toolbox for the evaluation of small production volume new chemical substances under chemical substance control law. And finally, Mike Rasenberg from ECA will conclude the webinar with an outlook on the future programs for the toolbox. All this time and until one o'clock, the webinar will also be open for questions. But before starting with the presentations, I want to conclude my introduction with an historical note on the toolbox. This project was initiated by OECD in 2006 with the version 1.0 released in October 2008. You can see a screenshot of that on the right. ECA then joined the toolbox coordination group in 2008 and is the major financial supporter of developing the toolbox. The latest public version is now the version 4.5. The technical developments have been done by the Laboratory of Mathematical Chemistry, LMC, of Burgas University. This project was possible because uh, uh, many people have supported it from the very beginning. Among them, we have Bob Diederich from the OECD, who left us this testimonial that the QSAR Toolbox is a key data analysis tool in the OECD chemical knowledge base. The toolbox supports chemical safety assessment and provides an alternative to generating data from testing chemicals, chemical effects on animals. And on the right, we can see a picture of uh, uh, Bob Diederik and uh, Professor Ovanes McKenyan, who is uh, uh, leading the laboratory developing the toolbox. We also have a quote from our executive Bjorn, uh, from our executive director Bjorn Hansen, who before joining NECA was working in the Commission, the European Commission, and uh, uh, Back then, there were the discussions on initiating a project to facilitate the use of uh, QSAR for uh, um, regulatory use, and Bjorn was one of the supporters of this project. He left us these quotes. The QSAR toolbox is iconic for how the OECD cooperates, international cooperation to meet common goals that result in a multiple of the individual inputs. We all need this tool to faster sort the same for the unsafe chemicals without using animal testing. 
And finally, we have a quote for, from Mark Bonnell, who is also a presenter today, because he and his institute have been using the toolbox since its first version, and they believe that the international success of their program was, would have not been possible without the toolbox. And on this note, I then um, leave the floor to Patience Brown, who has the first presentation of this webinar. Thank you. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where in the world you join this webinar from. It is my pleasure to be here today to give a brief overview of the OECD QSAR toolbox, current status and future developments. My name is Patience Brown and I'm with the OECD Secretariat in the Environmental Directorate and I am the Principal Administrator for the Working Party on Hazard Assessment and Pesticide Programs. So just as a bit of orientation and to provide a, a very high level overview of what is the OECD QSAR toolbox. The toolbox is a free software application that supports scientists in performing reproducible and transparent chemical hazard assessment for toxicological and ecotoxicological endpoints. But contrary to the name, it's more than just a QSAR tool. In fact, there are a variety of in silico tools available within the toolbox that include some key functionalities, such as the ability to retrieve experimental data, the ability to profile properties of chemicals, metabolism simulators from parent compounds, the ability to identify analogs and build categories, and to predict properties of chemicals and groups of chemicals. These in silico tools are key elements to support alternatives to animal testing. And here's just a few examples of how these can be used. For example, the toolbox can be used to inform testing strategies. By forming categories and identifying data gaps, intelligent testing strategies can be designed to optimize and hopefully minimize the cost of testing and the number of animals required to generate chemical safety data. In addition, the toolbox predictions can be used to replace information requirements for regulatory purposes from the industry side, for example, submitting dossiers, or it can be used as inputs for authorities work, for example, to prioritize or to evaluate substances. In addition, just even from the research and development side, the toolbox can be used to support sustainable development in green chemistry, even before chemicals are produced. So, in terms of governance, this is really a cooperative project. ECHA and the OECD both co-own and co-develop co the toolbox. And the work is actually executed by the Laboratory of Mathematical Chemistry, or LMC, which has almost 40 years of building structure activity models. These activities are carried out under the OECD umbrella, primarily the Hazard Assessment Program, and core developments are contracted by ECHA. There is a coordination group for the OECD QSAR toolbox that includes OECD, ECHA, and the IT developer, LMC. And there's also, as is the case with many other OECD projects, an expert group, the toolbox management group, that includes the coordination parties as well as experts from industry, regulatory authorities, and non-governmental organizations. There's also a variety of other partners that invest in the development of the toolbox. For example, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency has recently contracted with LMC to support integration of their on oncologic tool. And Japan has also developed a plugin for their QSAR tool, Kate, within the toolbox. But in addition to these, there's the ability of third parties to make their own extensions, for example, profilers or other QSAR models, available through the toolbox repository. The QSAR toolbox is updated regularly, and the most recent version, version 4.5, was released just the 20th of September this year. And this includes a variety of new functionalities, including a workflow editor that allows automated and standardized workflows for predicting grouping of chemicals, improved interconnectivity with the iEuclid database, and I'll touch on that in just a moment. There's also a variety of other uh, automated workflows that integrate with the defined approach for skin sensitization guideline. And again, I'll provide a little bit of detail on that, as well as expanded databases for human skin sensitization and phototoxicity. So really, this is an evergreen project, if you will. 
So to touch on one of the key elements of how the toolbox is being used currently, and this is really a recent development from the OECD side, I'd like to bring your attention to the defined approaches for skin sensitization guideline. This was released in just June of 2021, and it's the first guideline of its type. So in the defined approach for skin sensitization guideline, we have methods that are used in combination to arrive at the same level as the reference test method, in this case, the mouse local lymph node assay test for predicting human dermal sensitization response. In this case, uh, the defined approaches include a few different combinations of tests, but I'd like to bring your attention to one of the defined approaches, which uses two in vitro methods, along with QSAR toolbox predictions. These are used in defined combinations, and the resulting data are analyzed using a defined data interpretation procedure, meaning that any two users following the same defined approach for the same uh, chemical should arrive at the same conclusions. And this is really the first of its type of a test guideline that includes an in silico prediction, the results of which are covered by the mutual acceptance of data. The hope that this is will be a blueprint for other similar types of test methods, but just to illustrate a little bit of the new functionality that's included in version 4.5 of the toolbox, here you see how those QSAR toolbox predictions are included in the defined approach. There was extensive discussion among an OECD expert group who provided input on assuring the stability of the predictions across multiple versions of the toolbox, including QSAR predictions in the report submitted to regulators and the details included therein, as well as defining the domain of applicability based on the physical chemical properties, structures, and mechanism of the chemicals that were evaluated using the defined approach, the scoring of the in silico information included in the defined approach, and considerations for the first time of in silico predictions that are covered by the mutual acceptance of data. We really hope that these new approach methods using multiple different types of non-animal methods in combination will be the wave of the future for guidelines at OECD. So in addition to provide a kind of a vision of where we hope some of the information will go in the future and how electronic tools will be used in the OECD ecosystem, this is a high-level schematic of what we refer to as the global chemical knowledge base. So in this, you can see the central square here where we have a global chemical database that includes not only traditional toxicity testing data, usually in vivo data, but also mechanistic information. And this would be combined with exposure and use information in a common data platform. For example, we've illustrated here using iEuclid, although other data platforms are available. So in part, the reporting standards of information included in the chemical database would need to be structured and harmonized. And to help facilitate this, OECD has published the OECD harmonized data templates. So really, this is just a way of housing large amounts of chemical safety data globally. But in fact, we still need analysis tools. So part of the OECD electronic ecosystem of tools for analyzing chemical safety data includes a variety of other platforms that can provide input and also take information from this global, global chemical platform. For instance, uh, the uh, adverse outcome pathway knowledge base, as well as other third party tools. But I'd like to point out that the QSAR toolbox is really positioned to be a key analytical tool for information. We're seeing in discussion among OECD member countries increased global use by regulators of the QSAR toolbox in their regulatory contexts. You can see just a few highlighted here. But most importantly, I'd like to just finish this with talking about a few projects that are ongoing and forthcoming. So in the next six to 12 months, there will be continued updates to the QSAR toolbox. Version 4.6 is expected in early 2022. And these New York term planned updates include further alignment and integration between the QSAR toolbox and IUCLID database. So the IUCLID database has traditionally been used for reach data, but we're seeing increasing use globally by other regulatory authorities. So this is really a powerful combination of tools. For example, the integration between the QSAR toolbox and iEuclid will improve data filtering and searches and allow for deeper investigation of chemical safety properties. There is the option for improved reporting and continuing improvements and maintenance that are in support uh, of users. 
The QSAR toolbox assessment framework is also an ongoing project at OECD. This is being led by Italy. This is a project that's under the OECD Working Party on Hazard Assessment. And the point of the project is to review and possibly update OECD guidance documents on the use of QSARs for chemical uh, evaluation in a regulatory context. For example, possible update to the guidance document 49 on the principles of validation for the QSARs and also possible updates to guidance document 69 on guidance for validation of QSAR relationship models. So we really feel that the QSAR toolbox is critically positioned to become an increasingly powerful tool for end users and OECD member countries. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention and I look forward to other presentations in this webinar. Hi, it's me again, Andrea Gissi from the Computational Assessment Unit of ECA. In my presentation, I will talk about QSAR toolbox in rich registrations. In my presentation, I will explain how we assess different types of results from the QSAR toolbox when used by registrants to adapt the rich standard information requirements. So my presentation will speak about the assessment of different types of toolbox results. In more detail, we will see profilers and metabolic simulators, read across, and quantitative structure activity relationship. Before getting to the assessment, I just want to remind you that in the rich context, industry ensures safe use of their substances and they have to provide a minimum set of hazard information called the standard information requirements. QSAR and read across can be used to adapt these requirements according to rules that are specified in REACH Annex 11. And we in ECA check the information in a process called dossier evaluation. So what we are going to see today is how ECA assesses information provided by someone else, industry. Before going into details on how toolbox results are assessed, let's see first how much QSAR toolbox is used. At the moment, we have over 28,000 users and the toolbox has been widely used uh, under each. In fact, over 9,000 endpoint study records mention the QSAR toolbox for a total of, of, of over 3,000 rich registrations. If we take a look at the endpoints where Toolbox has been used the most, we see that the skin sensitization is the first one with over 1,000 studies mentioning the Toolbox. And then we have others, uh, genetic toxicity in vitro, uh, mainly AIMS tests, short-term toxicity to aquatic invertebrates, and so on. Let's start uh, with the profilers. They are the knowledge in the Toolbox linking uh, structures to mechanism of action and other properties of the chemical, even uh, affiliation to regulatory programs or information on, on chemistry and functional groups. They are tools to identify analogs and group substances based on chemical and mechanistic similarity. And are, they are also useful for screening purposes. In the same uh, profiler section of the toolbox, there are also the metabolic simulators. They provide information on predicted and observed transformation of the target substance. Using them, it is possible to identify analogs with a similar metabolic profile. However, you have to keep in mind that those simulators do not provide quantitative information or predicted metabolic maps. Profilers and simulators can be used to search for relevant analogs, eventually with experimental data, and or to cover elements of the read across justification, such as the category description, the impact of impurities, and also uh, to support read across cases built outside the toolbox. What you should not do with the profilers is to use them to fill data gaps directly. You cannot use lack of alerts as a proof of a, a negative prediction. Why? 
because profilers are not QSR models. They may not even fulfill the criteria for valid models, such as a defined applicability domain or appropriate measures of performances. And to give you an example, lack of mutagenicity alerts cannot be used to conclude on lack of mutagenicity potential of a substance, but can be used to find suitable analogs with data to build a read across case. Toolbox can then make prediction uh, using experimental data from analogs with the two different uh, uh, techniques called read across and trend analysis. It is important for you to know that ECA evaluates both approaches as read across using the read across assessment framework. The only exception for this are trend analysis for ecotoxicological endpoints where a high number of analogs are used. In these cases, we will assess it as a local QSAR. This difference is important because read across and QSARs under reach have to meet different rules as defined by Annex 11. What is also very important to remember is that when used as key information, the toolbox report alone is not sufficient. You need to provide adequate read across justification that you have to prepare outside the tool. We are working on improved reports to facilitate this task. In fact, what you can do with the toolbox is uh, to uh, cover the so-called assessment elements of the read across assessment framework, elements that are very important to justify a read across. You can convert that by using toolbox information. The table we see in this slide shows some example of assessment elements and how they are covered in the toolbox. As an example, it's very important in a read across the category description and the supporting information. Toolbox can help you because the category boundaries can be defined by profilers used for the analog selection, and the category justification can be supported by the explanation of the profiling results. Or, very important again for read across, is the link with structural similarity, and the structural profilers in the toolbox will also help you with that. And you can also read more in this uh, slide. Also, specific assessment elements of the RAF can be covered with, with the toolbox, and here we have examples of different uh, endpoints. Uh, you can then read in the slides uh, more details. We are also uh, improving the toolbox report uh, because uh, we want to address uh, some common deficiencies of read across cases uh, that we often see in rich dossiers. For example, we want to highlight the differences between analogs and target substance and their potential lack of impact on the ecotoxicological properties. Uh, right now, uh, Toolbox uh, and its reports focus on commonalities between uh, analogs and target. Now we also want to see the, the differences because these are required by the RAF. And also uh, um, another uh, aspect that is uh, very important is the quality and the reliability of the source experimental data. Remember that uh, the data uh, that are present in the toolbox, because they have been uh, donated, they may not include all the information needed to assess the quality of the source data. And in some cases, you may need to access the original source to uh, prove that uh, the data are of good quality and reliable. And uh, remember, ECA expects a justification in addition to the automatically generated toolbox reports. We see, um, Several, we have seen several cases where a QSAR toolbox report was attached to the Euclid dossier without any additional explanation. Uh, this is, uh, this is uh, not okay because we need to see all elements that are covered uh, and required by the RAF in a read across case, and this can be done only if you prepare a justification outside the toolbox. Uh, the QSAR toolbox also includes uh, QSAR models, many of them, uh, what you can access from the toolbox are the results and some details, some metadata on these uh, results. And this is very useful for screening or as supporting information for read across. However, if you are trying to do is to fulfill information requirements for reach, we advise you to, ru to run the QSAR models in their original platform 
because there you will get the full report with all details, for example, structure of analogs for some type of um, QSR models, also all the documentation and so on. So you better run the QSR models in their original platform and then include all relevant information in your dossier. The results will be accepted only if they are valid. And uh, earlier this year, we have uh, also published uh, a, a webinar on uh, how ECA assesses the validity of QSR results. Here you can find the link and can have a look if you haven't watched it yet. Uh, finally, a few words on uh, skin sensitization because uh, the latest version of the toolbox uh, includes also the automated workflow for defined approaches for skin sensitization. And it's uh, the first time uh, that uh, an automated workflow in toolbox includes also consideration on the applicability domain. Applicability domain is such an important requirement for the validity of, of prediction that it had to be included in this case. Because this case uh, or this automated workflow is now part of uh, an OECD uh, guideline, the one for defined approaches for skin sensitization. And uh, we are very proud to have developed the first and only free in silico tool that has ever been or became part of an OECD uh, guideline. And of course, this can be used for fulfilling uh, information requirements. We have recently published a guidance on how to use this guideline for reach. And you can find here the link. So to conclude uh, the final take home messages, toolbox results can be successfully used as key or supporting information for adapting information requirements in reach registrations. However, remember that adequate justification in addition to the toolbox report is absolutely needed for acceptance. And this is valid for toolbox results, but also for the majority of uh, alternative methods. Those results are more likely to be compliant for endpoints for which biological mechanisms are well understood and complexity of the effects limited, what we call the, the uh, low tier uh, endpoints. This is because these are models that are simulating those systems and the simpler systems are easier to, to, to simulate. And also usually there are more data available. And with this, I conclude my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Hello. The OECD QSA toolbox is a real toolbox with lots of tools which are helpful for assessing the hazard of chemicals. In this webinar, I would like to explain you how we use the QSA toolbox at ECHA to support the identification of persistent bioaccumulative and toxic substances. My name is Doris Hirmann. I'm working in the unit for computational assessment in the QSA team, and I deal usually with endpoints related to the environment. In the QSA team, we are assessing the reliability of QSA predictions and do also our own in-house predictions. Additionally, I am co-chairing the PBT expert group, which is an informal group to discuss issues related to persistency, bioaccumulation and toxicity. In the following slides, I will briefly address what type of information there are in the toolbox. I am going to introduce the ECA PBT screening profiler as a useful tool to get an overview of the various types of information available in the QSA toolbox. Furthermore, I would like to show you how we screened for precursors with the help of the QSA toolbox to find potential transformation products of concern. This includes two examples, one on bisphenols and one on perfluorinated substances. The QSA toolbox contains a wealth of information, including data on physical chemical properties, toxicity and fate, as well as information on structural alerts. In order to get information on properties of a substance, we can retrieve data from more than 50 databases included in the QSA toolbox. This also includes information on substance identity itself. It means the QSA toolbox reports how well the CAS number and the structure from the numerous databases and inventories fit together. Under the module data, we can retrieve available information for the substances we are interested in. 
Regarding PVT or VPVB assessment, we may, for example, be interested in data on n-octanol water partition coefficient and experimental studies related to bioaccumulation and biodegradation. Among the databases is also the ECHA REACH database, which contains the non-confidential information from REACH registration dossiers. Besides the experimental data, we can also get predictions for these properties. For example, we use calculators to predict the log KW, fish BCF, or biodegradation in BioVin. Under the module data gap filling are further QSA models accessible, such as the ECOSA, the Danish QSA database models, Vega models, and the Japanese Kate models. The QSA toolbox includes furthermore expert knowledge related to structures. This knowledge we can access via the profilers. They inform about affiliation to regulatory programs, predicted mechanism of action, predicted endpoint specific properties, and chemical description. For the PBT assessment, not only the parent structure is of importance, but also degradation products, which may be of concern. The QSA toolbox contains metabolic simulators. They provide information on predicted and observed biotransformations of the parent substance. To retrieve and check all this information can take time, especially if you're looking for more than one substance at a time. For this reason, we developed at ECHA the so-called ECHA PBT screening profiler to help us in our assessment. And we thought others may benefit from it as well, and therefore we made it available for everyone to use. The profiler is basically a workflow programmed within the QSA toolbox. We published it in April 2021 to support authorities and registrants in assessing the PBT and VPVB potential of sub substances. It combines experimental data and QSA predictions and considers the applicability domain if possible. The profiler follows the rules according to the BBT and VPVB criteria in REACH Annex 13 and REACH R11 PBT guidance. It gives also an alert if the screening criteria for bioaccumulation in terrestrial mammals and other air breathers are met. This example shows how the output of the profiler can look like. It highlights here in red if there is experimental data pointing towards persistent bioaccumulative or toxic properties, and in green if experimental data indicate the absence of these properties. It gives in the text information on what type of experiment da experimental data was found for example here, whether short-term or long-term aquatic toxicity studies are available. The profiler retrieves also various QSA predictions and tells whether the result indicates the potential for a property or not. It gives additionally information on whether screening criteria for bioaccumulation, which are based on partition coefficients, are fulfilled. We use it currently to screen for a potential PBT concern in groups of substances, and it has been saving quite some time. The ECHA PBT screening profiler can in principle also help to assess relevant degradation products. This functionality is not included in the profiler itself, as it would decrease the performance in terms of calculation speed. However, it is possible to combine the profiler with the simulators in the QSA toolbox. If this option is chosen, the profiler is applied to all predicted transformation products and results are summarized as shown in the screenshot. By double-clicking, more detailed information can be made available. I should say there can be many transformation products being predicted, and so this operation may therefore take a while. I would also like to mention that the QSA toolbox 
does not provide information about how stable a transformation product is or in what quantity it may be formed. Therefore, we would further analyze and search for supporting information if the profiler gives an alert. Limitations of the ECA-PBT screen profiler are that it currently works properly only with the last version of the QSA toolbox, which is the version 4.4. Vega add-in needs still to be updated to work for version 4.5, which is the most recent version of the QSA toolbox. Furthermore, the profiler for B cannot take into account the ionizability of a substance, and with that comes related uncertainties with predicting the bioaccumulation potential of such substances. If you would like to try out the profiler and give feedback, please send an email to the functional mailbox of the ECA PBT expert group as displayed in the slide. In the last part of my presentation, I would like to show you how we facilitate the screening for precursors with the QSA toolbox. A precursor, this is a substance which, which transforms into a substance of interest. In our case, we are interested in precursors of substances of concern. Precursor search can be done for any type of concern like PBT, CMR, endocrine disruptors, and this first example is about bisphenols, which have the concern regarding endocrine disruption. In this case, we did precursor screening for different types of bisphenols to support substance evaluation work. Starting points were lists of different bisphenol group derivatives. We created customized profilers in the QSA toolbox, which utilize the metabolism simulators. If you are interested in how to do such customized profilers, I recommend reading the tutorial under the link given in the slide. For the screening, we applied a number of simulators shown in the blue box on the right lower corner of the slide. They predict potential transformation products, for example, rat metabolism and microbial metabolism. The predicted transformation products are then compared by the profiler with the target structure and an alert is given if there is a match, as I will show you in the next slide. In the example, our customized profiler called BPA checked whether a predicted transformation product matched with bisphenol A as, a, as our target structure. For those substances where there was a match, the profiler showed an alert and also gave the information which metabolism simulator predicted bisphenol A. In the screenshot, you see that the second substance was identified as potential precursor. The same search as with the customized profiler can also done manually. For the example shown, 12 metabolites were found with the in vivo red metabolism simulator. When double clicking on this field, the predicted transformation products are shown. And you can see that bisphenol A here is among the predicted metabolites. Using the QSA toolbox helps us to screen also large lists of chemicals for precursors. The output can be exported in text file or Excel. The search is at screening level. So usually we run additional tools or look for supporting evidence regarding the likelihood of formation and quantity of transformation products. In the second uh, example, the second example is about perfluorinated substances, and it was done already a few years ago. As you may know, there are many per- and polyfluoroalkyl substances on the market, the so-called PFAS, and a one-by-one -one assessment was found to be highly inefficient and taking too long. For this reason, we looked into the identification of potential precursors for perfluorobutyric acid, perfluorhexanoic acid, 
and perfluorobutane sulfonic acid. So those could then regulate it together with the precursors. The aim was to identify the potential precursors to support the PFAS restriction work. The results have been used as input in the restriction report as shown below. We first selected the substances having the perfluoro structure as a substructure in the molecule. We used databases and inventories in the QSA toolbox, plus about 400 additional structures from an internal screening exercise. We used here as well the customized profiler functionality to identify target structures within all transformation products of the pre-selected compounds. Transformations were based on the simulators for hydrolysis and microbial biodegradation. From the about 1,000 structures we started with, we found around 170 potential precursors. With the example, I wanted to show that uh, we could also screen really large lists for precursors. And there are many databases with relevant substances in the QSA toolbox, and it contains useful simulators to predict potential degradation products. Probability and quantity are not part of the QSA toolbox predictions. As always, supporting information strengthens the findings from the screening. This brings me to the end of my presentation. I showed you some examples how the QSA toolbox helps us to do our daily work better and more efficiently. There are many more functionalities available in the QSA toolbox. So I hope my presentation inspires you to explore these functionalities. Thank you very much for your attention. Hello, everyone. My name is Eva Bay Vedeby. I'm from the Technical University of Denmark. We're a small QSAR team that collaborates with the Danish EPA about use of SARS and QSARs for regulatory purposes, and we have collaborated with them for 20 years or so. Thank you very much for inviting me to speak today about our use of the QSAR toolbox for screening of substances. The outline of my talk is use of QSAR toolbox simulators in a recent screening project to identify possible PPT, VPVB, PMT and VPVM precursors amongst REACH registered substances. Furthermore, to talk about a link that we've made between the QSAR toolbox and the Danish QSAR database. And lastly, QSAR toolbox profiler predicted alerts in the Danish QSAR database for 650,000 substances, including around 11,000 REACH registered and 80,000 REACH pre registered substances. So the PPT and PMT precursor screening was a project that we did for the Danish EPA. It was after an idea by Rune Jord from there. The idea was to use QSAR toolbox simulators to predict REACH registered substances to see whether some of them might be possibly degraded down to known PPT or PMT structures. In the environment, the substance can undergo both abiotic and biotic processes, and so we used three uh, simulators in the toolbox for auto-oxidation, hydrolysis, and microbial metabolism. And we combined them sequentially because sometimes uh, a substance can first maybe undergo auto-oxidation, and then the transformation products that come out of that may later undergo microbial metabolism, or the other way around, or many other ways around. So we combined these simulators sequentially. And then we compared all the products against known PBTs and PMTs from the ECA REACH candidate list of substances of very high concern that I abbreviate here by SVHC. So we had a list of 56 unique CAS numbers. And for 44 of those, we could find structure information in the SciFinder system. We also used the CHEMSEC SYN list, where we had 107 unique CAS numbers in total. But we only wanted here to use those that were not already covered by the REACH candidate list. 
So in the end, we had 66 substances that were not SPHC, but had structure information from SciFinder. Then we went into the toolbox. We had 12,800 REACH registered monoconstituent organic substances that we predicted in the three simulators I already mentioned, hydrolysis, autooxidation, and microbial metabolism in all sequential combinations. And as we could see that there were a lot of duplicates in the predicted transformation products, we made them unique before entering into the next simulator to speed up the process. And we made a library where we could keep track of which products came from which parents and what was the simulator that generated them. In the end, when we had done all these uh, combinations, we had the structures from the parents and from the, you could say, first generation, second and third generation. And we compared all of them to the SVHC and SIN list that I mentioned before to see if we had structural matches. And then we mapped all these substances we found also with the path that led to them. I also include here a technical note about how we did these large screenings uh, so that we were sure that Toolbox did not uh, try to use its own structure information for the CAS numbers we had and so on because we wanted to control the process, but that's more technical. So here's the result. In the end, we found in total 130 potential precursors for PPT and PMT substances, including 15 which were on the ECA uh, candidate list for SVHC. As you can see in the table, a lot of these hits came from the microbial metabolism. And Danish EPA wished to go further with the analysis to, for example, investigate to what extent might these uh, degradation products be generated? What are, what are the um, amounts that might be generated? And that can, for example, be done in catalogic. Turning to the Danish QSAR database, it's a free system that we you can access at the hyperlink I've given here, and where we have pre-generated predictions for a little over 650,000 monoconstituent organic substances. We have used a lot of models that we have developed ourselves, or we have licensed, or free systems. And they cover endpoints within physical chemical properties, human health, and envi environment. And the idea of the database is that you can, for example, look up a single substance where you get all the predictions from all the contained models in one big report so that you can see how do they look, do they uh, support each other, or is it maybe a substance that's more difficult to predict, and so on. And in the end, maybe you can reduce the overall uncertainty in your weight of evidence assessment. You can also use the database to screen across all the contained predictions and structures in the database, and you can combine previous searches in at, as advanced search combinations as you wish. For a little over 40 of the models that we have made ourselves in the so-called LeadScope system, we have made them available in a sister site to the Danish database that's called the Danish QSAR models, where users can go and predict their own structure and get more details in the predictions in the so-called QSAR prediction reporting format with both the identified alerts, probabilities, and closest analogs in the training sets. And both these two sister sites are continuously being updated and expanded when we have new models and add new functions, et cetera. So the Danish QSAR database is linked to the OECD QSAR toolbox. An earlier version of the Danish database was incorporated into the toolbox, but the new database that we released in 2015 is much bigger and it's also more dynamic when we expand it and so on. So it was found more feasible to make a link between the two systems where we keep the, all the predictions on our server and then the toolbox contacts the server and retrieves predictions if the users wish it. And they can do that in the data gap filling step. Um, maybe they are working with a category where there are some of the analogs that don't have uh, experimental information and they would like to see what the models are saying. Or maybe they have experimental information and they would also like to see what the models are saying. And 
maybe in some cases the QSAS can contribute uh, to um, the read across hypothesis if they are predicting endpoints that are not contained in the OECD QSA toolbox profilers and so on. The included endpoints from the Danish database are positioned in the toolbox endpoint hierarchy. We did this work in collaboration with developers of the toolbox from the Laboratory of Mathematical Chemistry, University of Burgas. So this was an example of data from the Danish QSAR database going into the toolbox. Looking the other way to see the data that we have used from the toolbox to go into the Danish QSAR database. We have used a lot of profilers to profile the 650,000 substances in the Danish QSAR database. In total, we have so far used 17 profilers within skin sensitization, estrogen receptor, genotoxicity and cancer. For some of the profilers, we have profiled only the parents, but for others, we have also included relevant simulators to also predict alerts in the transformation products. And we wish also to do that in the, for the rest of these in the future. And also we wish to also add even more profilers in the future. Here's an example of a report you can download from the Danish QSAR database for a substance. There's a lot of pages, so I'm not going in the details, but just to show you what it looks like, these are the two first pages. And then further down, when we pass the environment and FISCHEM and go into human health, here's the first time we have alerts from the toolbox profilers. Here for skin sensitization, where they're positioned together with QSAR predictions, also for skin sensitization. And here more from skin sensitization, estrogen receptor together with other molecular endpoints and more estrogen receptor. Then we go into genotox here, DNA binding prof uh, profiler alerts, AIMS profile alerts, and then more genotoxicity and cancer. Here I've included a little film of what it looks when you go into the database. I have a CAS number. I would like to see if it's in the database and if it's predicted for AIMS mutagenicity. So it's in the database and here I have the AIMS model. You can also see you can search the profilers here in the bottom. But now I just went in and see, is it predicted to be an AIMS mutagen by the AIMS uh, battery model? You can also go in the sister side, I just pointed at that, to make a QPRF. But let's also see how we can use the database to find closest analogs from the training set. So that's what I'm doing here. I'm searching the positive and the negative from the AIMS model training set, and I'm combining them with the OR function. So let's download the report for the substance to get the SMILES notation. So that's what I'm doing here. I get the SMILE string. And then I go back into the database because what I would like to do now is to go into all the training set substances and sort them by similarity to my target. So that's what I'm doing here. I'm pasting in the smiles and then I'm pressing similarity sorting. So here's the result. And then we can add some further columns. So first, let's see which ones were positive and which ones were negatives in the AIMS training set. So I take experimental and add that. And here we can also add further columns. So now I'm adding toolbox profiler uh, results for AIMS, and I'm also taking the DNA binding profiler alerts. Here they, they all agree, uh, they find the epoxide and so on. In other cases, maybe they have slight differences in what they identify. You can also add other things like, are there any analogs that are REACH registered, or are there even some that have a EU CLP harmonized classification? Then you can scroll down and look at the analogs. And in fact, here there were some that have a harmonized classification for mutagenicity. You can download a report with the top 30 uh, most closed analogs. And let's see what that looks like. Here it is. You can see which searches were done and which were the analogs. With that, I conclude my talk and thank you very much for your attention. And I would like to, of course, acknowledge all the supporters of the Danish QSAR database and my DTU colleagues, 
Nikolaj Nikolov, Anna Nissen, Cecilia Müller, and Henrik Tulle, who's uh, a pensionist who's worked a lot of, many years in Danish CPA and now is working with us uh, in his free time. Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. My name is uh, Cecilia Bossa, and I'm a researcher at the Environment and Earth Department of the Italian National Institute of Health. ISS is the technical and scientific body of the Italian Ministry of Health and the main center for research, control, and technical scientific advice on public health in Italy. In this presentation, I will show some examples of how the QSAR toolbox supports our group especially in assessing the genotoxicity of chemicals. Our group is the in silico toxicology unit founded by Dr. Romualdo Benigni and is currently composed besides me by Chiara Battistelli, Alessandro Giuliani and Olga Ceremezkaya. Our main area of work concerns the development and application of computational methods in toxicological risk assessment. The work includes uh, the study of structural activity relationships based methodologies, the study of the toxic action mechanisms of chemicals, the development of statistical and system biology models, the analysis and standardization of experimental data, including the creation of databases. And furthermore, the group is actively committed in promoting the QSAR toolbox. Our daily work does not take place in a chemistry laboratory, as we don't usually mix with test tubes, reagent, plates, and similar stuff. Uh, we instead, we frequently use the QSAR toolbox as our lab bench for the in silico toxicology experiments. As for the duties of ISS, our activities are carried out both for research and for institutional purposes. I will go through some examples of how the QSAR toolbox supports us in such activities. Among institutional activities, ISS supports the member state competent authority in substance evaluation and dossier evaluation within the REACH framework. Our unit in particular is involved in the evaluation of in silico methods, such as QSAR, read across and grouping approaches usually for general toxicity and carcinogenicity endpoints. In this context, we rely on the QSAR toolbox for a number of operations, such as um, to perform an initial structural inspection and chemical identity verification, to take a first look at experimental data availability, to perform the in silico toxicological profiling, to get some insight into the mechanism of action of chemicals, to search for the existence of analogs, to verify read across elements, category consistency, and also in some cases, QSAR results. And we also find very useful as a working basis, the data matrix in tabular form that is generated by the software. Another area of institutional activity that I want to mention is related to the national remediation sites. Our institute is asked to express opinions on the definition of the threshold concentration of contamination. In the presence of a non-regulated chemical that lacks sufficient toxicological information, in silico approaches may apply. First of all, the possibility to read across the threshold value based on similar substances has to be evaluated. For this purpose, we look for analogs in the in-house inventory of regulated substances that we have implemented in the QSAR toolbox and use the software for read across assessment. If the read across is not applicable, then a TTC approach should be envisaged and a preliminary genotoxicity evaluation should be performed. The various steps of it can be assisted by the QSAR toolbox, as well as the application of the Kramer class evaluation in the final TTC approach. I will now illustrate a couple of examples of uh, research activities. The first example focuses on the work performed by our group in an EFSA funded project on the applicability of in silico models for predicting the genotoxicity of pesticides. In the execution of the project, we made extensive use of the QSAR toolbox 
as is it illustrated in the uh, publication, in the related publications. One of the objectives concerned the characterization of the structural changes resulting from the transformation from active substance to the metabolites that are produced in the metabolic or degradation processes. The data set provided by EFSA, which is also implemented in the XR toolbox, contains results on many different genotoxicity assays on parents and metabolites. For the analysis, we use an in-house database of each parent metabolites group in which we maintain the parental relationships between each active substance and its metabolites and combine the different results of each test system into an overall outcome in order to have a unique result for each chemical in each test system. We focused on chemicals with the AIMS test results because this assay is the most represented in the database allowing to draw a more comprehensive picture. The in-house data set of a um, test result consisted of uh, approximately 900 chemicals, of which one third were active substances, with a proportion of positive negative results very unbalanced towards the negatives. To analyze the structural changes in terms of functional groups, that occur more frequently in the transformation from active substance to metabolites, we focused on very similar active substance metabolites pair to select chemicals with the same core structure. We made a preliminary screening using the QSAR toolbox similarity options on some sample chemicals in order to choose the metric and similarity coefficients best suited for uh, our purpose. When we then built a similarity matrix of each active substance metabolite family and selected only those pairs with 70% or more similarity. This yielded 320 pairs. In the next step, we have then described each chemical in terms of structural features. The chemical group's composition for each chemical was obtained with the structural characterization profilers from the software tox 3 and QSAR toolbox. The results from the two softwares were then adapted and merged from the matrix of active substance metabolites filtered for similarity and uh, described in terms of chemical functional groups. We then computed the structural changes occurring more frequently in the transformation from active substance to metabolites. When we then evaluate this, the impact of these structural changes on the mutagenicity potential, the results are shown here in pictorial form in terms of chemicals, features and substructures that are likely not to alter the reactivity of the parent compound when transformed to the metabolite. This piece of information may be used in a read across or a weight of evidence approach, supporting the mutagenicity evaluation of pesticide metabolites. Another research activity concerned the improvement of QSAR profiler for predicting AIMS mutagenicity. In 2014, the Japan National Institute of Health Science has launched the, AIMS, the first AIMS QSAR International Collaborative Project. In, in three successive phases, they provided a number of modelers with approximately 12,000 new AIMS results on chemicals that have not been previously used for developing QSAR models. This data set is also very unbalanced toward negative results. At the end of each phase, the modelers had the opportunity to exploit the new experimental results to test and refine their models. From the results of the exercise that, is reported, uh, that are reported in this publication, it appears that all tools were considerably improved with this extended database. We participate where our model implemented both in TOX3 and in the QSAR toolbox softwares that is in vitro mutagenicity AIMS test alerts by ISS. For the analysis, we built in-house databases uh, in toolbox of selected group of chemicals from the original list of substances. 
We then used toolbox for the QSAR toolbox for chemical structure inspection, for functional group analysis, and for screening uh, the list with the relevant profilers. Then we built uh, in uh, the QSAR toolbox our custom profilers with uh, modified alerts in order to refine the original list and verify the results. We were able to improve the sensitivity of the predictions without penalizing too much the specificity. And now we are testing the modified list of, uh, in, with the new substances of the new collaborative project. In summary, I've uh, illustrated some examples of uh, how our group uses the functionalities of the QSAR toolbox, both within the toolbox workflow and as constituent elements for other analyses. And I want to conclude by showing uh, in this slide some of our publications related to the use of the QSAR toolbox in our group. For With this, I want to and then to thank you for your attention. Well, hello everyone. My name is Mark Bunnell. I am Senior Science Advisor with the Ecological Assessment Division of Environment and Climate Change Canada. And today I'm talking to you about the QSAR toolbox and our applications of it for ecological priority setting uh, in risk assessment of organic chemicals in Canada. Um, I hope to point out with this presentation the many applications, important applications we've used the toolbox for over the years, and um, not just for priority setting and risk assessment, but you'll see in the presentation for a lot of other activities that we conduct both at the research level and at the assessment level, regulatory level, and at ECCC. Historical context first, I think, is useful. Uh, we've been a core member of the management group uh, supporting the development of the toolbox since its inception and when Gil Weith was actually chair of the group back in those days at the very beginning when even the just formulating the concept of the toolbox was uh, was was being done between LMC and, and Gil Weith and, and others. Uh, but we've seen an evolution of its application uh, in our agency, both with regulatory and research scientists and uh, it's been, a, a, I guess, a rapid increase um, lately uh, because of the uh, changing functionalities in the toolbox, making it a bit more user friendly, for example. So our, our main uses still have been for prioritization and ecological assessment of organic chemicals, but we have had other specific applications as well, um, very important to uh, our agency, such as model integration, science development, uh, chemical profiling for research, for example. And we've donated bioaccumulation databases in, uh, um, on behalf of our, regular, our academic institutes in Canada. Um, and so you have an examples of the BCF, BAF, and BMF uh, databases and metabolism rates that are in the QSAR toolbox, largely coming from John Arnott and, and colleagues um, and this, to increase the awareness of this science in the toolbox. Well, I'm, I'm going to focus today a little bit on specific applications. I mean, because we, we I think it's generally used across the world for gathering empirical and predicted data, and that's a common use of the toolbox for both targeted chemicals as well as analogs uh, for new and existing substances. But I think also the toolbox is very useful for other types of applications, including category building, read across, uh, profiling for prioritization and risk assessment, endpoint, endpoint correlations, QSR development, uh, integration with other software platforms that we have here at ECCC, and also uh, a couple of slides on contributing science to improve the toolbox. Uh, I mentioned bioaccumulation, but I'll talk a little bit more about mode of action in coming up in a couple of slides. And just an experience from uh, building chemical categories for 1300 organics in phase three of the chemicals management plan or CMP. We did a number of iterations involving the toolbox using a clustering function in the toolbox, but also some manual verification and sorting uh, by chemists, both at Health Canada and Environment Canada. And uh, this uh, initially resulted in a lot of fragmented subgroups and we had to um, sort of assimilate them into larger groupings suitable for assessment. 
such as the broad groups you see in this um, examples of amines, acids, and alkanes. Um, so just a couple of other small details here. Structural similarity was the main um, functionality of grouping at that time. And we came up with 76 organic groups and 55 organic individual organic substances. And that actually set the stage for the grouping approach used in phase three from, so that would be 2016 to now, still ongoing, still finishing up CMP3. Um, so it was instrumental in that regard, the toolbox was. In, in terms of, um, I guess, a public read across example of the use of the toolbox was for dechlorine plus uh, an organic flame retort. Uh, this is a case study that was conducted with our uh, CMP science committee and topic 7B. Um, we provided some background documentation for its second meeting. So this is a few years ago uh, on the use of read across for risk assessment. The topic of the meeting was you uh, read across for risk assessment and you can at this link below, you can see some of the doc background documentation and pub and the report from the CMP Science Committee, um, where you you can uh, look further at how read across was examined by the committee and the example for dechlorine plus using some information from the toolbox. I think importantly, the toolbox played a big role in our we, what we might call a modern modernized way of prioritizing organic chemicals or 21st century. Our first version of this type of approach was called the Ecological Risk Classification of Organic Substances or ERC. And it is more or less an integrated approach to testing and assessment type of uh, methodology. And we examined or re-examined 640 organic chemicals originally prioritized in 2006 as persistent or bioaccumulative and inherently toxic. So these are PITs and, and BITs, or pits and bits, we like to call them. So the ERC approach was the subject of an OECD IATA case study in the third cycle, and there's a public report available on that at the OECD's IATA website. And the QSR toolbox featured prominently in the chemical profiling of hazard in ERC version one. And more specifically, this is the general workflow of the ERC system version one. And the, the chemical profiling aspects using the toolbox were for mode of action, chemical reactivity, and estrogen receptor binding in, in particular, fitting into the hazard profiling component um, next to the exposure profiling component as the workflow proceeds to eventual risk classification of, um, of organic substances for those 640 substances. Um, again, from 2016, and, and we're still working on a few of these, finishing those off at, uh, in 2021. And just the impact of that, uh, mode of action and estrogen receptor binding were among the, I, I guess, very important hazard factors that determined the um, high concern aspect or outcomes of, uh, of these 195 high hazard substances. So 195 of the 640 turned out to be just high hazard, not high risk necessarily, but high hazard. And uh, so mode of action and, and estrogen receptor played a prominent role where chemical reactivity using a lot of the profilers in the toolbox used as a flag only at that time because we were uncertain in 2016 about just how to apply this type of information for ecological purposes uh, I think we've learned a lot since 2016, and, it, and as I'll show in the version two of it, it features quite prominently in the system, uh, and so therefore the toolbox does as well. So uh, yeah, just to note that these were uh, those uh, mode, of, mode of action estrogen receptor supplied by the toolbox. Now on to version two. So based on the success of the first version, and really a demonstration of a proof of concept of, of this type of approach. We, we developed version two in 2018 to 2021, and we've considerably expanded on the first version um, in terms of toxicological exposure space and more tr transparent weight of evidence. And these are, this system is being applied to non-PBT substances that determined in 2006, so about 12,200 non-PBTs. 
Um, and uh, the blue um, highlight here is to, to point out the fact that almost all in vivo empirical data, and many in silico and in chemical and in vitro hazard data points, were collected or generated using the toolbox, uh, various versions. And now uh, with version 4.5, uh, we might consider an update in the future because uh, actually ERC is actually version 2.2 right now. We'll publish it as version 2, but it's like any system, it's getting updates. So just to note that the technical document and the results for 12,200 substances will be published early next year. There was some delay with our elections to get this out to the public, but we expect to have it out um, uh, in 2022. Show you in more a little bit of detail exactly what I meant by what I just said. Uh, the yellow boxes here represent some of the uh, data types um, and endpoints in behind the uh, chemical profiling descriptors in the hazard profile in particular for ERC2. And you can see that uh, um, many of the endpoints here are uh, gathered from the toolbox or from the profilers or databases uh, and, um, and mode of action uh, 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 profilers as well. So just to point out, it's, it's playing a critical role in the version two of the ERC. Um, I did mention endpoint endpoint correlation, and this is actually for ERC2. We wanted to demonstrate, again, chemical reactivity as an ecological concern. And so it was useful then to work with some of um, Terry Schultz's early work with tetrahymena and protein binding, which forms a big part of uh, the empirical database for in chemical type of interaction, or sorry, um, uh, in vivo reactions, but uh, correlated within chemical protein binding assay information. So you can see a lot of species uh, demonstrate this um, increased toxicity with potency of binding and uh, given the, the scales are on log one over mole. So although the data points change from many to few, it, this is depending on what's in the databases uh, for both RC50 as well as uh, the um, Growth, uh, growth, or growth inhibition databases for for various species. I've been uh, building QSARs not for some time. You can see in this slide. Actually, you may be able to see in the slide. This is actually version 1.1 of the toolbox. Uh, we have built for hindered phenols or alkyl phenols uh, some some QSARs uh, just to demonstrate its functionality more than anything, but. Quite honestly, uh, these are perhaps underutilized. This functionality of the toolbox is underutilized by our agency. I think in part due to other external QSRs available that can meet the need. Um, but also, I think it's lack of awareness or, or internal uh, and a need for internal training on some of these functionalities using um, existing toolbox guidance, for example. So I think this is something that could we could grow on. Uh, or go into, um, better word, um, in the future. I think, uh, importantly, the toolbox is connected to some of our other platforms. And here's an example where, in version, using version 4.4.1, we have connected the toolbox to our chemical pipeline uh, profiler for hazard and fate. So uh, the pipeline profiler uh, talks to the toolbox and gathers um, uh, both empirical and, and profiling information, and uh, puts it back into the profiler, and um, and then we have a one continuous output uh, that um, involves both QSARs that are contained in the profiler, uh, as well as information from the toolbox, and this gives us a nice, um, yeah, holistic chemical profiling approach, both for hazard and fate. And I think importantly, um, these tools will uh, feature in the future automated version of ERC2 that I just talked about, we are planning to uh, um, uh, to do that uh, for chemicals not contained in its database. In other words, outside of the 12,200 chemicals uh, the system was parameterized for. And um, getting near the end here, uh, just to have a, uh, I think from my perspective, some important aspects of our involvement with the, with the toolbox is adding new science to the toolbox, a new ways to explore chemical reactivity uh, and, and in this case mechanism mode of action and molecular initiating events we were involved in a, a paper 
that came out in 2021, um, partnering with uh, Liverpool John Moores University and Unilever to connect molecular initiating event information with mode of action and mechanism of action. And in the end, have one of the most, if not the most, uh, comprehensive um, um, lists of um, cross species susceptibility to uh, molecular initiating events and mechanism and mode of actions in the, in the literature. And the important aspect of that of work is that it's um, featuring into some software that the toolbox connects to. It, uh, it, it first, the, the information, the new scheme from that published paper will, will be added to the Creatis's ISAFE Rapmacoa profiling software. And this is just a, a schematic of, of, of what that, that software looks like and the output. And so we have then enter the the, uh, the Creatis as a partner in this work. And ultimately, however, um, the uh, the updated scheme from the Sapundu et al. paper will go into the Makoa iSafe RAT software, but the iSafe RAT software is already a plugin for the uh, toolbox uh, in version 4.5 that is uh, added um, separately after one, one installs the toolbox. So you will see an update to the iSafe RAT Makoa toolbox profiler uh, in the Q3 of 2022. And so um, that will be a future update. So we're really excited about this work uh, furthering the uh, mechanism of action type uh, molecular initiating event uh, in silico side of profiling chemicals. So I, I'm really keen on this, this work and I think it's very important for understanding hazard. So that's it really. Thank you very much for your time and attention. And uh, I wish you all a good day. I'm Yuki Sakuratani from National Institute of Technology and Operation in Japan. Today, I'm going to talk about the application of the QSA toolbox, the evaluation of small production volume new chemical substances under Chemical Substances Control Law, CSCL, in Japan. This is an actual example the regulatory use of the QSA toolbox. Uh, in 2020, an assessment flowchart for biodegradation and bioaccumulation has been introduced in the confirmation process of small volume new chemicals under CSC called QSA assessment flowchart. The QSA assessment flowchart Prioritized, prioritized chemicals based on the structural similarity to regulated chemicals and the prediction results of biodegradation and bioaccumulation by QSA and VLABOS. In this presentation, an overview of the QSA assessment flowchart and the role of the QSA toolbox in the flowchart are introduced. This slide shows an overview of CSGL. The Japanese government conducts this assessment in two phases, both before and after placing the substance on the market. Before placing on the market, pre-marketing notification and pre-marketing confirmation are required for new chemicals. After placing on the market, the chemicals are categorized into five categories. The class one specified chemicals are the category for persistent and bioaccumulative and toxic chemicals. This is the most strictly regulated category under CSC. And this category is harmonized with the POPs chemicals under Stockholm Convention. The second one is monitoring chemicals, which are the category of persistent and bioaccumulative chemicals. 
the types of procedure, of the pre-marketing notification and evaluation depend on the production volume of chemicals. For the chemicals, more than one ton per year are required to submit experimental test data. On the other hand, the chemicals less than one ton per year called small production volume chemicals are not required to submit test data. So the small production volume chemicals are usually evaluated only by their chemical structures. The evaluation of small volume chemical is called confirmation. If a chemical is confirmed, the chemical can be placed on the market, but not confirmed. The chemical cannot be placed on the market. Every year, more than 20,000 chemicals are notified as a small production volume chemicals. So the confirmation process for small production volume chemical is very significant work for the evaluators. This is an, a background of the new confirmation process. Previously, evaluators confirmed the submitted small volume chemicals by visual confirmation by using the picture of chemical structure submitted. In the new confirmation process since 2020, notifiers of small volume chemicals have been required to submit electronic data in chemical structure, that is, MOL file. By using the submitted MOL file, the chemicals are prioritized by the QSA assessment flowchart to provide support information to evaluators. The approach to confirm small volume new chemicals consists of two steps. First, we identify the, the analogs of the regulated chemicals. There are two target categories. One is the class one specified, specified chemicals, which contains 33 PBT chemicals. The other is monitoring chemicals, containing 38 PB chemicals. And then we apply QSA and relapse to the to the analogs identified. This is the QSA assessment project for small vo production volume new chemicals and the CSC. The chemicals submitted are screened by custom profiles of the QSA tools to identify the analogs of regulated chemicals. By using the QSA tools, we can effectively identify the analogs of regulated chemicals. For example, the profiling result for 10,000 chemicals can be obtained within one number. And then the identified analogs are further screened by QSAR models. And then read across assessment are conducted to the chemicals predicted as persistent and bioaccumulated by QS. The chemicals predicted as persistent and bioaccumulated 
accumulated by Rivacross as the highest priority chemical group to be focused for expert judgment. As a result, we can prioritize a lot of chemicals notified and provide them to the GSCL Council with support information for final decision. We are using four profilers. The level one profiler identifies the chemicals that are similar to a uh, CSC regulated chemicals based on the substructure. The level two profiler identifies the chemicals that are very similar to a CSC regulated chemicals based on structure similarity. And the level three profiler identifies the chemicals that match to a CSC regulated chemical. In addition, we prepared a profiler to identify the chemicals that match to a POPS chemical other than the CSC regulated chemicals. That is, the chemicals not categorized by the any profilers means that means that has no structural analysis from any of the CSC regulated chemicals. The chemicals categorized by level one or level two profilers means that as the structural analogs of any of the CSC regulated chemicals. And the chemicals categorized by level three or POPS profilers means that matches to our regulated chemicals. This chemical will be not confirmed. This is the level three profile identifying the chemicals that uh, match to a CSC regulated chemical. This is the list of regulated chemicals and the CSC. The structural boundaries for 74 chemicals are defined in the profile. This is the purpose profile identifying the chemicals that matches to a POPS chemical other than the CSC regulated chemicals. The structural boundaries are defined by SMART, which was introduced from the version 4 of the QSAT. We found that SMART is very useful to define a complex structural boundaries, such as PFOA related compounds defined in the Stockholm Convention. Uh, this is an example of the profiling result by the custom profilers. The first chemicals, the first chemical matches to a CSC regulated chemical. The second one does not match to any CSC regulated chemicals, but this chemical is very similar to five regulated chemicals. The third one has a similar substructure as that of a CSC regulated chemical. The fourth one, the fourth one matches to a pop chemical other than the CSC regulated chemical. In the read across assessment process, available knowledge related to the bioaccumulation of the target chemical, such as analog chemicals, with experimental test data are gathered. 
the QSAT toolbox is used for searching the analog chemicals. As I mentioned before, the chemicals predicted as persistent and bioaccumulated by lead across as the highest priority chemical group to be focused expert judgment. The QS assessment flowchart is published and the profilers used in the flowchart can be downloaded from our website. By using them, companies can foresee the possibility of the confirmation of their chemicals in advance of investigation. We support companies to utilize the QS assessment project by tutorials, seminar, and help. In summary, in 2020, an assessment project for biodegradation and bioaccumulation has been introduced in the confirmation process of small volume new chemicals in the CSC QS assessment project. By introducing the QS assessment project, the efficiency, the confirmation process of small volume new chemical is remarkably improved, and the scientific evidence used for confirmation is clarified. The QSA toolbox plays an important role to improve the efficiency in categorizing chemicals for the QS assessment project. It supports companies to utilize the QS assessment project. This concludes my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for this great presentation. Um, in fact, all presentations were very, very interesting. Um, my name is Mike Rasberg. I am the Director of Hazard Assessment and I've been here in ECA following the QSA toolbox since the 2000, uh, since 2011. And as we've seen, the title of the webinar was the QSA toolbox um, applications for reach and beyond. And I think it, it has become clear during the presentations that it's truly beyond in, in different ways. Uh, one, one beyond is in the context of that we've seen examples from, uh, from over the world. Uh, we know that the use uh, is increasing uh, on, a, on a global scale of the QSA toolbox. And I think that is a lot to do, has a lot to do with the fact that we, we do this work very consciously in collaboration with the OECD and we truly see the value, the value of that. The other beyond is indeed that this is clearly not, uh, the QSA toolbox clearly has not only a role in reach, but there are many different uh, applications and also here. We, we understand there are more and more people, jurisdictions, regulatory regimes that are looking into the QSA toolbox as a means of, of helping um, assessments, helping prioritization, et cetera. We saw indeed different approaches uh, today. And the one thing that you might thought is missing is an industry angle to the story. And in the original program, we had industry representation. Unfortunately, it was a uh, it was a cancellation. But we know from discussions with industry that uh, they are using the toolbox also a lot in terms of their work, and especially when it comes to early identification of chemicals uh, in terms of their product development and identification of chemicals of good candidates and possibly not so good candidates. So we know that uh, that this this angle wasn't there this time, but in the next webinar we will uh, make sure that we also have industry colleagues with us. We saw indeed reach application and especially how we in ACA look at the use of these toolbox in registrations, and with that we really want to really encourage people to use it uh, and but do it in a, in a robust way both scientifically and regulatory so that we can uh, we, we can accept them, which is the thing that we all want to achieve in the end of the day. We saw a number of different approaches for screening and evaluation indeed. And, and as I said, in, in, from different jurisdictions, from different contexts, and, and we saw examples from Japan and, and Canada. And I think Canada has been 
probably almost even more than ACA or the Commission, uh, uh, a user from day one, and especially Mark Bunnell is, uh, is one of our greatest ambassadors uh, of the tool. Now, recently I saw on uh, on the website, on, on, on the internet, a, a quote by somebody who I don't know personally, but the person said, the QSA toolbox has layers and layers of usefulness. And I thought that that is probably the best way to describe it. We, we had a lot of discussions on, on since the uh, since emerging of the QSA toolbox on is QSA toolbox really the right name? And we haven't really resolved that, but it's good to see that the people out there, the audience, um, uh, have realized that it's not QSAR, it is indeed layers and layers of usefulness. So now if we if we start to look more forward uh, on what is there to come, you know, maybe one of the questions is, do we have more layers to, to come? And, and thinking about the future and, and how we move forward with the QSAR toolbox, I think besides the fact that we will expand and improve uh, what we have, um, we have reserved money for that. It's an ongoing uh, process and it's an ongoing activity. But looking further into the future, I, I'm, we can look at it from three different angles, perhaps. One is more the IT, uh, if I can use that word. It's more the position of the, of the toolbox and, and how it will evolve. The other one are the regulatory developments, the needs specifically coming from, uh, from regulatory uh, regimes. And then lastly, but equally important, the scientific developments, especially for approaches and techniques that are more and more um, getting, getting exposure and getting more integrated into the regulatory um, scenarios and, and, and um, reality. So if I go to the IT um, side or the positioning side, is the QSA toolbox has been developed as a tool that you can use on its own um, as a standalone thing, uh, so to speak. And already in recent years, we've opened up the QSA toolbox much more for, for data to be integrated into the tools, for QSAs to be integrated into the tools. So we've started to open up the toolbox as such. One of the more recent uh, work is to really bring the QSA toolbox closer to our, our chemical database, uh, the Euclid application, which is not only, it's a yet another uh, tool that we developed together with the OECD, and Euclid is really used by more and more authorities, and it starts to be really not only a data format, but also a vehicle to really exchange uh, data not only uh, EU reach, but also EFSA, for instance, the food agency in Europe, and uh, our, our colleagues in Canada, the US, and especially in Australia and New Zealand, the colleagues have really taken on the use of Euclid uh, as an integrated tool. So that is an example where, you know, we have two we have two tools that have a function and a role in the regulatory world, and we're bringing them together. And ultimately, we were also looking into making, for instance, functionalities of the toolbox available in Euclid, vice versa. So slowly but surely, you can get this image of different tools that with different needs and different purposes. But the idea from, let's say, an IT point of view is that we're bringing them together so they're more integrated, they can more exchange uh, data and knowledge, uh, etc. If I take the angle of the regulatory developments, uh, so we, we, the recent int integration, I should say, of the QSA toolbox in the skin sensitization um, 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 approach, um, defined approach, um, is a milestone in terms of a formal acceptance of the toolbox as a regulatory tool. Um, and we believe that this is, is a starting point uh, in terms of having the toolbox more, even more recognized as a tool as such. We know that in Europe, we have the chemical strategy for sustainability coming, uh, coming towards us, all of us. And principally, it has a, a higher demand of understanding of potential hazards of the, of the chemicals. And if you take something like a circular economy, understanding the hazards before introducing chemicals in any circular uh, chain, uh, is going to be more and more important than it ever was. And again, the QSA toolbox, especially at early development of products, is a key instrument here. And, and we foresee that it will, the, the functionalities and the tool and the data will, will, will have a prominent role in this, uh, in this um, area. 
Then we also slowly but surely start to talk with, with colleagues uh, that, are, that are managing other regulatory contexts and, and doing other types of assessment. And the interest in using the toolbox, for instance, in assessing uh, degradation products or impurities is getting uh, is increasing. And again, more and more formal. So from a regulatory, in, with the regulatory needs increasing, we also think there is a great opportunity for using the toolbox in, in those, in fulfilling at least partially those needs. And finally, in terms of scientific developments, and I'm not talking state of the art scientific, I'm talking about science developments that are very close to the regulatory uh, reality and the, the adverse outcome pathways is obviously a reality also in a, in a regulatory context, been there for quite some time actually, if you think about it. But we are looking at how best to place the toolbox to interact with, with AOP type of information and approaches. And for instance, the ToxCast uh, data, which has been um, developed and made available by our colleagues from the US EPA, uh, that's integrated. So we're really looking at how can we make that type of information, how can we start integrating that into the toolbox? Either integrating or making sure that we can actually connect with databases and approaches out there uh, to enrich the, the use, not only of the toolbox, but also of the other tools collectively to tackle the challenges of, uh, of chemicals management. Now, if I go even more, you know, outside the, the the current scientific realm and look at approaches like omics, metabolomics, for instance, then we're already looking at how can we get, how can we handle not only the data in Euclid, for instance, but also how can we integrate such knowledge in the toolbox of the future, um, and and rather than trying to absorb them, we're really looking at this this concept of integrating and connecting. And so ultimately, to come back to the, the, la the layers of usefulness is we will work on the layers of usefulness. I'm, I'm, I'm really happy with that, with that statement. I think it's, a, it's, it's fantastic. Um, using the layers of usefulness, not only in the QSA toolbox, but adding it and combining it with other layers of usefulness that are, that are out there and, and that we, some of them we manage and ultimately have a platform that really delivers means to do accurate, fast and animal test-free assessments in a regulatory context, because with an increasing uh, need and an increasing time pressure, the QSA toolbox is one of the vehicles that can uh, play a useful role in all of this. So this was a, an outlook on how we see it all evolving. Um, being very happy and proud, reflecting back on the um, sessions we had today on where it's used and all that. Um, the Q&A is still open for a few more minutes, so put in your last questions. And with that, I hope you all continue to use or start using the QSA toolbox with great enthusiasm, but also with a critical view. It's always good to get your feedback uh, and your suggestions to further improvement. And with that, I want to thank you. Thank all the speakers uh, and say goodbye for now.